It was a case that set off the largest civil rights movement in the United States in decades. Today, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who murdered George Floyd last year, was sentenced. It's one of the longest sentences a former police officer has ever received. Chauvin got 22 and a half years, although prosecutors and the Floyd family wanted the maximum. Chauvin could be paroled for good behavior after serving only 15 years. A jury convicted Chauvin in April of murder, and here's how Attorney General Keith Ellison responded to today's sentence. We need every community member to continue the call for real reform and meaningful change, peacefully, constructively, but clearly. Above all, Congress has still not passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I call on leaders and members of Congress to pass the best and strongest version of this bill that can be passed and to pass it now. Yesterday, just before leaving for July recess, Senators Tim Scott and Cory Booker and Congresswoman Karen Bass announced they reached an agreement on the general framework for a police reform bill. But they gave no real details on what's in it, so we still don't know whether it will include an end to qualified immunity, nor do we know if any of the Republicans will actually sign off on it. But we have a framework. Well, joining me now is the CEO and co-founder of the Center for Policing and Professor of African American Studies and Psychology at Yale University, Philip Atiba Goff. Uh, Philip, you may have some thoughts and some feelings today. Let's start with the thoughts. Yeah, so on a day like today, which is the, the culmination of a terrible tragedy, you start to think about, well, did we get what we wanted out of this? Um, you know, the family says that they were looking for 30 years, 22 and a half is not quite there. That's standard in a case like this. Judge gave, uh, you know, some respect to prosecutors. It's an up charge um, from the, uh, the sort of uh, standard uh, elements of it, but it's not the, not the maximum. But this is a process that was only able to hold an individual accountable, accountable for what is clearly a systemic problem. There are 1,000 people killed by law enforcement every year without ceasing, without the numbers going down, since the Washington Post started collecting those data after the terrible uprisings in Ferguson. So we've got some accountability for one of the four officers who was present, for the officer who had the knee on the neck, but we haven't even begun to think about what processes do we have to get accountability for the system that was a problem. So that's the first thought that I've got is this is accountability. It's historic and it should be embarrassing for all of us that it is historic. Also historic, nine minutes, 22 seconds captured on video, 22 and a half years in prison. And we're looking at potentially uh, less than that, only 15. And the final number is the number of violations he had before. Which one of those numbers is the most meaningful after the sentence today? Yeah, so every one of those is one that's gonna be etched into history books. I mean, uh, provided that we're allowed to continue teaching history in this country. Um, <clears throat> every one of them is a number that we should, we should remember and we should tell our children about. But I think none of those are the thing that we want to be central from this. I don't want nine minutes and 29 seconds to be the thing that everybody remembers. I don't want 22 and a half years or the 15 years. I don't want any number of prior, prior um, complaints of excessive force to be the thing that we remember from this. I want the date. I want May 25th, 2020 to be the thing that we remember because I want everything after that and the way that we deliver public safety to the most vulnerable to be fundamentally changed as a result of what we chose to do. Right now, the conversation is about, were we harsh enough to this individual who lynched a black man in public? You're gonna have some folks who say, well, punishment shouldn't be the only answer and we don't wanna be locking up people forever. You have some folks saying we should have thrown the book at him and he, and he got off light. I heard some people say he got off light. I don't want us to fixate on what we do to this one murderer. I want us to fixate on how we reimagine and construct systems of public safety that prevent it from happening next time. May 25th, 2020, that's the number that I want us to have in our heads. 
Let's get to some feelings then that we're having in this moment. Uh, after the culmination of the Black Lives Matter movement with a sentence today, how do we handle and balance the desire for retribution with the desire for celebration? Yeah, I don't know I've spoken to anybody today who feels emotionally satisfied with this outcome, right? If you feel like um, the criminal legal system's job is to punish wrongdoers and you want to feel good about the outcome of that, you saw the family of George Floyd looking relieved and incomplete. Mm -hmm. There's a hole punched in that family. No one's feeling satisfied with this because you can't get satisfaction for fundamental injustice. Everything feels too light, too thin. That's, just, that's an indictment of the system that we've got after a tragedy like this happens because we can only hold individuals accountable. So I'm sitting here with feelings like everybody else, like, I guess it's good. It's not as light as it could have been. It's definitely a departure from what we've done historically. I guess that's good, but I don't feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like there's been a resolution to this. You said that, you know, a culmination. It's a culmination of this particular tragedy, I guess, but the ambivalence that I'm feeling is, is the ambivalence that I'm hearing back from everybody I'm talking to today, because we don't have systems in place to get actual accountability for the full structural problem that makes these things happen in the first place. I was struck by what uh, Felonius Floyd had to say at the press conference in speaking about his brother and his brother's legacy and that his brother's murder put Felonius in the position of comforting and now uh, the, the, the families of other victims of police violence. So when you talk about who we want to remember and what we want to remember in this moment, he mentioned Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Dante Wright. There are so many names. Are any of those names, is anything at this moment going to move those Republican senators who refuse to address criminal justice reform? Yeah, it's a good question. And I wish I had an answer that filled me with hope and optimism that I could share with you. I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take to take uh, federal action on this. The bit of, of hope that I've got in me is all of those names that we remember because of the tragedy of their death. I, I want us to start remembering the names like Darnella Frazier, mm. right? Like Samira mm. Rice. Like those who survived, like Gwen Carr, like like the folks who who do things with their lives to to honor and lift up those names. And the thing that is wonderful in the lives that they're living in the wake of their own tragedies is that in this country, it won't be federal action that seals the deal anyway. It's going to be state and local. So your neighborhood, your block, your city, your town, your county, your village, that's where it's really gonna happen because we got 18,000 law enforcement agencies and whether or not you want law enforcement, it's gonna be solved agency by agency, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So I don't know what the Republicans are gonna do on this particular bill. I'm glad that folks say they've got the structure of a framework of a thing that might one day happen that we might one day find out about. But I'm gonna tell you, cities, communities aren't waiting and those who have lost loved ones know they, they won't be waiting. And so we don't have to wait for the federal government either. They can lead or they can get dragged behind us. Well, and that's where this really comes down, right, is as, as there's federal or national inaction, there's a groundswell uh, amongst people and local communities. Police officers come from communities, right? That's the theory behind community policing. Police unions, though, have really done a number on the system. What is your take on how we address the, the stranglehold that police unions have on the criminal justice system? Yeah, so there's no set of, of racial justice activists I've ever spoken to who have kind words for the idea of police unions or police benevolent associations. The interesting thing for me is that there's not a lot of chiefs or sheriffs who have a kind word either. Yeah. So I know cities where there are chiefs who have fired law enforcement officers for habitual violations of civil rights, uh, habitual violations of, of departmental code, and the union fights to get them brought back. You know, we just had a union um, saying, well, we need to fight to make sure that the chokehold can come back and be made legal in New York State. Um, when you have a, a set of organizations that are so out of step with the values of the people whose consent they need in order to govern, in order to enforce law, then I got to say, it's not long before the people rise up and say, this is unacceptable to us. Again, you, you got to be abolished or you got to reform radically in this moment or you're going to be gone.
right? Like there, there's just no sustainability uh, for the ways in which communities are in tension with the folks who say they represent those who are supposed to keep those communities safe. Well, and that is certainly what we're seeing, right, is we are seeing that uprising, as George Floyd's daughter said, her daddy changed the world. Now, the question is, are we going to be able to meet that moment ourselves? Quick final word before I let you go. So I get that question a lot, and I get it as the final word. I'll tell you this, I have no idea, except we get to decide. The only thing that we know comes next is what we collectively decide must come next. And if we keep our focus on this, if we're not just talking about this on this night when there's one announcement, but we stay on it, then we have the opportunity to, to make sure that her daddy changes the world forever and in the best of ways. And if we don't, we'll see the pendulum swing back the way it always has, and tough on crime will, re will replace the values that we've been trying to, to lift up in community after community after community. Stay focused, stay involved. We will take those as our final words. Philip Atiba Goff, thank you for joining me tonight.